How awful. <laughs> Do you want to hear how awful the last, like, hour before I got home was? Because I didn't tell you when I got home. Oh, sure. Okay. First things first. Uh-huh. My power went out at work. Fun. While I was sending out the last email of the day. Did you hear... Okay, so my office at work has no windows. <laughs> Creepy. Yeah. So I was like, blackness. <laughs> it's dark in here. I'm scared. Um, so it was a little alarming. So it took me like, I probably would have been home probably like 20 minutes earlier. God. I know, which is really annoying. How very dare you. Um, and then on my way home. Mm. Izzy. Izzy. I know, it's really awful. Are you ready for, to hear this? On my way home, I was presented with the middle finger. Presented? Yes. It was displayed to you? It was displayed to me, and uh, how rude. Against your consent? Okay, can I just, like, put a PSA out there sure. to, uh, don't flick people off. Why? Because it's just, it's meaningless. It is. It doesn't do anything, but sometimes it sure does feel good. It doesn't feel good to me. No, it doesn't. Why were you flicked off? I honestly can't tell you. Oh, I was okay. in a lane. Is he? I was in a lane driving like a normal person. I was actually driving 75 miles per hour. I was driving. I was speeding. Oh, no. Maybe that's why. Um, no. The person was up my butt. Oh, that's offensive. There's <laughs> two things about your consent. <laughs> it was up my butt. So I switched lanes because I got out of their way so that they could go past me so they could stop being at my butt. And when they passed me, they flicked me off. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was so kind to you and got out of your way. Oh. Are we surprised it was a man? White? Yes. Middle-aged? Yes. In ah, a pickup truck. What are, what's the male, ver oh, so he's a Trump supporter is what you're saying. <laughs> okay, not all pickup drivers are Trump supporters. Let's clear the air. Most of them. Uh, I know one that's what, not. What is... What's the male name for, like, a Karen? Donald. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. That one was just right there, wasn't it? It was right there waiting for me. Anyway, so that was the awful thing that happened to me on my way here. Treat people with kindness. Don't flick them off. Patron especially saint when Harry they haven't. Styles. Yes, our patron saint, Harry Styles, said treat people treat with kindness. Treat people with kindness. This is the point where my brother turns Maybe off the podcast. We can da -da -da, find a. Now he's definitely turned off the podcast. Wait, too very good. We're just on. Should we do the whole thing? Yeah. All together now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We won't do that to you. We're sorry. There's probably like 2% Harry Styles fans listening no, to us. No, no, I don't think that's correct. Mm, no. I just want to be alone in this. I want to be the hipster of Harry Styles world. No. <laughs> I'm all to myself. No, 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 no. The only the only time I want people not to like him is when we're buying tickets. <laughs> yeah, don't go to his show so we can then add it. too many people like him. Is this the Harry Styles podcast? Oh, gosh. He's not awful, though. Here so. we go. He's pretty great. I'm going to do this podcast with our assistant in my lap. Again. Are you are you okay issue. with that? It's an HR issue. Do you consent? We don't have an HR department. So. Is he? Is he? Okay, good talk. Anyway, um, so uh, last episode, we picked categories, mm -hmm. and uh, I chose B's favorite topic, mm -hmm. aliens. Mm -hmm. And uh, B, tell everybody what topic you pulled. I forgot. Oh, cults. <laughs> You only did research on this topic I did, all week. It, it, I will admit to you that this week was not fun for me. This week felt like <laughs> homework. I, uh, I did not enjoy. There was way too much information. I should have given up and picked a different cult. Um, oh, you did find your headphones. But I did not. Yeah, they're on my head. <laughs> Were you just pointing at my empty case? <laughs> I'm really sleepy. Okay. Anyway, so much editing for you. <laughs> or not. <laughs> okay. I like to leave this stuff in for fun. Okay. So yeah, aliens and, and, and cults. cults. Which I think can kind of go hand in hand if if you don't believe in UFOs and you think that the UFO world is a cult. Sure. 
I don't actually think that, but some people might. I let I uh, to clarify. Mm. I don't like aliens because I am not stupid enough to believe we are the only planet with life right? on it, and that we can be the only like e- existing, you know, human like things. And I just don't. I don't want to meet them. I don't want to see them. Oh, I don't either. But it I find them very terrifies any- me. I don't want to spoil this movie for anybody, but if anybody's seen the movie Arrival, you'll know what I'm talking about. I genuinely believe (laughs) that the movie Arrival depicts how an alien human encounter might occur if they were to land on Earth. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, which has not always been the case with all these UFO stories that I've read. So um, that's just my little my little intro to aliens is my standpoint. I'm gonna take time to say hello. Hello. You've been waiting in line. I don't know what that was. Oh, Moosh is in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> that's across our apartment. I told you this mic picks up everything. I feel like it's picking up even more this time. Buddy, are you okay? Okay. I think we're I think we're good. I think, I think we're, we're in the clear. Okay. <laughs> this is off to a great start. Okay. So Tanya's topic was aliens. Mine was mine was cults. And I believe I have to go first, right? That's I have right. to read yours first. Yep, you're going to read my story about aliens first. Oh. Get it over with. All right, okay. Well, going to open it now. Let's see. Oh, there's no title. Uh-oh. It's a mystery. <laughs> yeah, it's, ooh, it's a mystery. Okay, here we go. Aliens. The date is June 21st, 1947. We are in Maury Island. Maury. Okay. A small <laughs> island in Washington. Harold Dahl was an alleged, not, not to be confused with Raul Dahl, uh, was an alleged harbor patrol man. It, alleged? He was an alleged. Some people don't actually believe he was a, a harbor patrol man. Oh, oh, okay. I was like, oh, he was an alleged. Okay. Okay. Um, alleged. Okay. There's no, there's no fact was, in this. Was an alleged harbor patrol man who was patrolling near the eastern shore of Maury Island, gathering logs to resell to local sawmills when he witnessed six donut shaped... Ooh, donut. <laughs> I knew you would like that. Six donut shaped <laughs> objects hovering approximately a half mile above his boat. One of them lowered 1,500 feet towards him and released metallic debris-like rain hitting his son Charles, burning his arm, and killing the family dog. The worst part of this story. Let's take a, let's pour one out for a homie dog. We don't have a name. I'm going to name him Peanuts. Why is it plural? It's cuter that way. Okay. Um, Okay. Dahl snapped some photos that he later showed to his supervisor, Fred Chrisman, who was incredibly skeptical. Is Fred me? Yes. Chrisman returned to the sighting spot to take a look for himself and actually did see the aircraft with his own eyes. So now we have two witnesses. Alleged. Alleged. Witnesses. Witnesses. Everything's alleged when it comes to UFOs. Yes. The next morning, a man in a black suit visited Dahl and had breakfast with him at a diner. He recounted to Dahl the whole ordeal in extraordinary detail. He said, quote, what I have said is proof to you that I have a great deal more about this experience of yours than you will want to believe. Okay. Dahl was warned to never speak of the events he witnessed, otherwise awful things would happen to him. Awful. Awful. And according to Dahl, bad things did happen to him. Some examples are that his wife attacked him with a knife. That's just menopause. <laughs> and his son... What? Is that, is that not normal menopause? No. Oh, could have fooled me. Uh, and his son Charles disappeared to be found at a restaurant in Lusk, Montana, two weeks later, with no recollection as to how or why he was there. All right, his son Charles went on a bender, <laughs> ended up in Lusk, Montana, two weeks later, and just well, I don't know why I was an alien. Okay, whatever happened to me? The first call made was to Kenneth Arnold, a pilot who had experienced his own alleged UFO sighting. On June 24th, 1947, near Mount Rainier, Washington, just three days after. The government report written in 1949 was the first widely reported sighting of the so-called Flying Saucer. The report stated that Dahl and Crimson reached out to a magazine in Chicago in an attempt to sell their story. 
The magazine editor contacted Arnold to verify their story. Arnold invited two officers of Army A2 Intelligence to come to Washington from California. The day they left to return to California, their plane caught fire, crashed, and killed both officers. Crazy, right? Things like to randomly catch on fire in California. Okay, but they were not in California yet. They were in the sky on their way to California. And the plane caught fire in air? Yes. So these two officers came here to investigate uh, this alleged UFO sighting. Uh um, And literally never got back to tell the tale of what they had discovered. So I find that tidbit pretty interesting. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, cool, cool. (laughs) She's good job. She doesn't she's gonna struggle with me and aliens. He doesn't find it as interesting Uh -uh. as I do. Nope. Okay. The FBI's investigation into their sighting deemed it a hoax after Dahl and Crimson later admitted it as such. However, it's sort of rocky to believe their case being a hoax when we just told you Dahl was warned to never speak of this again. Dahl also stated that if questioned by the authorities, he was going to say it was a hoax because he did not want any further trouble over the matter. Or it was a hoax. Keep reading. Okay, a book entitled, They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers. (laughs) Really? Great title. (laughs) Uh, by, By Gray Barker was published in 1956. Barker recounts Dahl and Crimson's story and connects the dots between the man in a black suit and three similarly dressed men who allegedly visited Albert K. Bender, a UFO enthusiast, in 1953. Oh my God, not men in black suits. You never see them. Mm -hmm. Bender described them in his own book published in 1962, Flying Saucers and the Three Men. They're really great on titles. Um, As men with frightening expressions who, quote, floated about a foot off the floor. Okay. They looked like clergymen, but wore hats similar to Hamburg style. Like fedoras. Okay. Their faces were not clearly discernible, for the hats partially hid them. The eyes of all three figures suddenly lit up like flashlight bulbs. They seemed to burn into my soul as the pain above my eyes became unbearable. In the 1960s, UFO researcher John Keel spoke to many UFO witnesses about their encounters with these men in black. <laughs> he coming in black. Oh. Okay. Who were described as having an olive complexion with a stiff, robotic demeanor. Witnesses claimed the men drove phantom Cadillacs. <laughs> phantom Cadillacs. Yes. Okay. So they have Cadillacs in this planet. Phantom ones. Fan- phantom ones, but okay. Keel once claimed to have received an anonymous phone call followed by a car chase with said phantom Cadillac. It disappeared inexplicably on a dead-end road and was never seen again. Keel specifically recalls in his book, The Mothman Prophecies, there we go, the story of Major Richard French. In May of 1967, Mrs. Ralph Butler from... <laughs> Owatonna, Minnesota. Oh, yeah. Owatonna. Oh, yeah, Minnesota, yeah. Owatonna, Minnesota. My sister state. Okay. Was visited by a uh, French claiming, <laughs> claiming to be an officer with the U.S. Air Force. She offered him jello, just to be polite, and to her astonishment, he attempted to drink it, <laughs> claiming to have never seen jello before. It was strange to her that an Air Force officer had never heard of jello. Must be an alien. She eventually instructed him on how to eat it with a spoon. When he arrived, French was wearing a neat gray suit that appeared to be brand new, along with unscuffed shoes. She described him as 5'9 in height, olive skin, pointed, pointed face. I don't know. Pointy face. (laughs) Pointed face. With long, dark hair, which didn't match the requirements the Air Force had for hair length. There was a lot of speculation about who Richard French was and whether or not he was an imposter, However, in 2013, at an event held at the National Press Club in Washington called Citizens Hearing on Disclosure, an 80-year-old former Air Force colonel named Richard French claimed to have been responsible for covering up UFOs. He would say it was swamp gas, anything they could come up with to convince the general public. He averaged about three UFO cover-ups a week. He was also referred to as the alleged lead investigator of Project Blue Book in the 1950s in a Huffington Post article written by Lee Spiegel. 
The man in black sparked immense fascination for UFO enthusiasts who speculated as to who this person, persons, could be. Was it a government employee, an alien, Major Richard French, Project Blue Book, something else entirely? As you probably already figured out, The Man in Black inspired not only a comic book series, but the beloved movie franchise, Men in Black. Yes. So Men in Black uh, is based off Pointy Face Dude. Is based off of all of these stories that, um, and this theory that if you were to witness a UFO, a man in black shows up and is very aggressively tells you, you better not talk about this. If it doesn't have a flashy thing. No, I think that was uh, that was creative liberty. <laughs> ah, too bad. Um, but for those who don't know uh, what Project Blue Book is. Don't know. Um, according to Wikipedia, it was one of a series of systematic studies of unidentified flying objects, a.k.a. UFOs, conducted by the United States... United States! <laughs> conducted by the United <laughs> States Air Force. I don't know why I said United so weird. United States! Uh, it started in 1952, the third study of its kind, following projects Sign and Grudge. A termination order was given for the study in December 1969, and all activity under its... What? Auspicious? Auspicious. Let me see. Spell it with your P's. No, that's not auspicious. <laughs> anyway, a termination Aus- order was okay. given for the study in 1969, and uh, all, acti- all activity officially ceased on January 19th, 1970. Project Blue Book had two goals, to determine if UFOs were a threat to national security and to scientifically analyze UFO-related data. So this was an actual company or oh. branch, I guess, conducted by the U.S. Air Force. Real thing. There was a TV show about it. I watched the first season. I wasn't too impressed, but it was still pretty it was a, fascinating. It was a fictional TV show? Yes. Oh, okay. I think it was on the History Channel. Okay. I'm not sure. It's like a scripted show about okay. Project Blue Book. For those interested who might yeah. uh, who might find some fun in that. I mean, there are definitely people interested in... Oh, yeah. ...in UFOs and extraterrestrials and it would never be me. Got to give us something for the show. What? Some enthusiasm of some kind. Uh, yay, aliens! <laughs> it's like improv. <laughs> I know. I don't know. I tried, guys. Um, so anyway, so that's what inspired Men in Black, which I think is pretty cool because B and I definitely loved... Those yeah, Men in Black is fun. Um, I like this song more than the movie. Sure. Probably. Oh, I like. I love that movie, but it's not many movies I don't love. No, you will literally watch anything. I will watch anything. Anything. Yes, I at all. <laughs> anything a chance out of respect to the artist who's trying yes. to make it. If she won't watch it, then like, I don't. I don't know. And it's got like a. Two percent on. If it's like super problematic, I probably will not watch it. Cuties on Netflix. Well, like, if it's like you know, starring uh, a man, a rapist. Yeah, like, no, I'm good. Yeah, that's fair. I'll pass. That's fair. Um, if it's a Woody Allen movie, I'll pass. Uh, Yeah. Um. So my resources were history.com. Uh-huh. Uh, there was an article by Justin Sablich. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. We're going to mispronounce a whole lot. Um, called Men in Black Real Origins. Uh, a podcast episode of Sound Effect. Um, and an article by Micah Hanks for Paranormal Radio. Uh, that's where I got all my Richard French information from. Okay. Yeah. If you have a UFO... <laughs> Sighting, I guess, or uh, an encounter. Encounter. If you've been abducted by aliens, then you can shoot us an email. Hey, people are not always abducted. A lot of times. How awful podcast. A lot of times. Gmail.com. Yes. How awful podcast at Mm gmail.com. I talked over you. I'm sorry. That's okay. A lot of times people see a UFO, lose time, and don't recall anything that happened in the time that they've lost. That's usually the case. Okay. So most encounters... So people claiming anal probes are probably... Uh, well, I mean, I think... Uh, I mean, I don't want to say whether or not that's true because I don't think that... I don't, I don't, I don't know. Alleged. Alleged. Um, 
But most of the cases that I have heard of or read uh, claim to have had lost time, which is a very common theme with UFO experiences. Sure, sure. I have never, ever seen a UFO, nor have I ever suspected I saw a UFO. And there's been all those weird sightings over LA, but then they always somehow tie like, back to Elon Musk. <laughs> they're like weird, like NASA things. And we're all like, oh my God, I'm the aliens. Every and time. Like, every time. Well, a lot of UFOs are um, like weather balloons. Not not that you, UFOs don't, aren't always. A lot always, of mistaken yeah. UFOs. Here's the thing. UFO is is an unidentified flying object. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's aliens, but mm-hmm. which is why we were very careful to not call this category UFOs. We yeah, wanted to call it aliens. Extraterrestrial aliens. Whatever. Because I'm not going to tell you a boring story about how somebody saw a weather balloon. <laughs> Oh, good story. Dang, that was going to be my pick for when I got this topic. <laughs> I honestly think you'll find it more fascinating when you have to. So Mary researcher. Richards in Kansas saw a weather balloon. Yes. Did you see, you watched Unsolved Mysteries, right? I did not finish it. Oh, okay. So you didn't see the I UFO didn't see episode. the UFO episode, okay. no. It's really good. Um, I figured I would ease you into aliens with like a cool with a, with origin a, story. The men in black story. Yeah. You, 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 you lubed before the probe. Is that what you're saying? Ew. <laughs> Please don't. Sorry, mommy. Ew. Okay. Ow. Um, okay. Chug and ride along. Chug and ride along. My topic was cults. Uh, I, I picked the wrong thing because it just had a plethora of information. Every site had, um, different the pieces of information that a different site wouldn't have. So I tried my best to make sense of it. There are definitely going to be things missing. Uh, I might even have misinformation. There is so much information about this that it's just, it's impossible. So it's a, it's a hefty one. We'll try to just summarize it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll do our best. We're going to do our best. Yeah. So. Thank you for doing all the research. Yeah. You're, yeah, you're welcome. And allowing me to shine with my reading skills. Yes, you're going to shine with your reading skills, and I'm going to plug in more information. I'm a shining star, so bright in the sky. Starlight, star Not an alien. Light. This is our singing episode. I'm going to sing in every episode. <laughs> but tonight is... I'm really doing this podcast to be discovered. Oh. Yeah. Sorry if you hear our assistant smacking... She she thinks it's dinner time. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, here we go. All right. Cults. Episode four, Colts. Mm, yelling. All right. Ooh. The People's Temple Agricultural Project was a remote settlement established by the People's Temple, a San Francisco-based cult under the leadership of Jim Jones. Jim Jones. Okay, I'm very that, familiar with this yeah, story. That doesn't that doesn't mean a lot to people. A lot of people, yeah. Well, we'll keep reading. Yes. I read Jim Jones and I know what this is. Yes, I figured. Okay. The People's Temple was formed in Indianapolis, Indiana in 1955. Mm -hmm. At the time, Jim Jones was not affiliated with any particular denomination and had no theological training. He claimed to practice what he called... Apostolic. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I don't know religions. Apostolic Socialism. Yeah, so Whoa. apostolic socialism was influenced by um, Marxist liberation theology. Okay. Um, popular among Latin American clergy um, at the time, and Jones mixed social concerns with faith and healing and a really enthusiastic worship style derived from black churches. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So you just, you know... Made a melting pot, and that was so that was his style. A little cultural appropriation, appropriation there. Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, the temple preached that quote: "Those who remain drugged with the opiate of religion mm-hmm. had to be brought to enlightenment, socialism." End quote. Mm-hmm. Fudge. Mm-hmm. After Jones received immense criticism in Indiana for his integrationist views he with his wife marceline 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 jones 
We could go Marceline. Marceline. <laughs> we could go Janice. <laughs> Janice and Marceline. Uh, and his wife, Marceline Jones, yeah. moved the temple to Redwood Valley, California in 1965. Okay, so integrationist views literally just mean he believed in racial integration over segregation. And okay. then their Indiana folk uh, didn't like that. Right. So it's one of the only good qualities of good old Jimbo <laughs> was he believed in integration, not segregation. Right. Okay. There you go. Well, you know Malcolm X technically kind of believed in segregation. Did he really? Sort of. I don't want to say he believed in segregation, but he believed um, in separation of sorts. Okay. He, he felt that the black community should stick with the black community. Why the hell would they want to engage with the white people i don't blame him for feeling that way right yeah anyway just a little history jimbo's there. gonna prove uh malcolm x right in that sense why you want to mix with the white person <laughs> gosh right yep uh okay in the early 70s the temple branched out to los angeles and san francisco they settled outside the town of have fun with this <laughs> yukia yukai yukia y- yukia Whatever. california with around 100 followers. All right. It's got a, it's got a steady following so far. Mm-hmm. They believed that the move would protect them in the event of a nuclear holocaust. Mm-hmm. No red flags, clearly. None. <laughs> Jim Jones began to make friends with politicians and the press in California and eventually became a respected church man. Thousands of followers of large percentage. Nope. Whoops. Thousands of followers, a large percentage of them being African-American, flocked to him. His biggest draws were his displays of mind reading and faith healing. So normal stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, while the temple was active in humanitarian causes in the communities, Jim's treatment of his followers was often less than humane. Temple members were regularly humi- humiliated, beaten, blackmailed, and many were coerced or brainwashed into signing over their possessions, including their homes, to the church. Jeez. Yeah. So, okay. Remember how I said Jimbo's one good quality was he believed in integration? <laughs> this is where that backpedals at about 100 miles per hour. <laughs> Gotta catch them all. Yeah. Because Jimmy Jam liked to convince his black members <laughs> and members of other minority groups that if they left the temple, they would be rounded up into government-run concentration camps. Family members were kept apart and encouraged to spy and inform on each other. Cute. Yeah, so he just took, he just snatched that one good quality, he snatched it away real quick. All right, well, in 1977, after members of the press began to ask questions about his operation, he packed up and moved with several hundred of his followers to Jonestown. Dun, dun, dun. dun, dun. <laughs> A compound that he had been building in Guyana for the last few years. Oh, dear. Here we go. I know where this one's going. No one's heard of Jonestown. (sighs) The U.S. Embassy and local government in Guyana was essentially uninterested in his compound and let him do as he pleased, gaining him and his followers relative autonomy. They exercised no control over the community Due to the fact it seemed to be contained to the compound, so not mm-hmm. leaving the compound. No, they, do they never they went there. into Guyana for anything. Um, and that it was remote, self-sustaining, and self-governing. Also, the Guyanese government was busy enough with governing the Guyanese citizens that essentially they just didn't care about this community of Americans doing their own thing. Yeah. So, like, within the compound, they had their own civil administration Police and fire protection, education, health care. Um, they were like growing vegetables, fruits, chicken. They like had it all. Wow. So they right. were fully sustainable and contained. So they just were like, all right, you have your own police force. You have your own fire station. You guys are cool. Survive on your own. Not our problem. Come on, come all. Jones made his followers... Work 12-hour days. Huh, sounds familiar. Yeah, right? Uh, Building the community and servicing the other members with little to no breaks until eventually his wife took over the cause and established eight-hour work days with breaks. All right, all right. Marceline wasn't about that, uh, you know, 
I don't want to say slave life, but no. Well, that gr- that grind, that grind. Yeah, she went about the grind. Rise and grind wasn't Marceline's deal. Well, I get it. Jones also began to run what he refers to as white night rehearsals. Mm-hmm. Okay, here Jones would address his followers regarding Jonestown's safety, claiming that the CIA and other intelligence were conspiring with quote capitalist pigs to destroy the settlement and harm its inhabitants. After work hours, when purported emergencies arose, the temple conducted the rehearsals. Jones would give the members four options. Attempt to flee to the Soviet Union, commit, quote, revolutionary suicide, stay in Jonestown, and fight the alleged attacks, or flee to the jungle. Sure, yeah. Fun. So Jones regularly studied Hitler and Father the and Father Divine, sorry, who I hadn't heard of until this point. Me neither. Um, to learn how to manipulate members of the cult, um, Father Divine himself told Jones to find an enemy and to make sure they know who the enemy is, and it will unify the members of the group and make them subservient to him. So we're not going to get into Father Divine. You can Google that, but he is his own brand of just delightful. What a delight! Exactly. Father Divine. Okay. Uh, On at least two occasions, the, quote, revolutionary suicide vote was reached and a simulated mass suicide was rehearsed. Temple defector Deborah Layton described the event in an affidavit as follows. Everyone, including the children, was told to line up. As we passed through the line, we were given a small glass of red liquid to drink. We were told that the liquid contained poison and that we would die within 45 minutes. We all did, as we were told. When the time came when we should have dropped dead, Reverend Jones explained that the poison was not real, and that we had just been through a loyalty test. Mm -hmm. He warned us that the time was not far off when it would become necessary for us to die by our own hands. The temple had received monthly half-pound shipments of cyanide since 1976, after Jones obtained a jeweler's license to buy the chemical. It was commonly used to clean gold. In May of 1978, a temple doctor wrote a memo to Jones asking permission to test cyanide in pigs as their metabolism was closest to the was closest to those in humans. Again, no red flags detected. In September of 1977, former temple, t- former temple members, Tim and Grace Stowen, Sure. Stowen, Stone, yeah. I'm going to go with Stowen. I'm not good at pronouncing names. No. Uh, They battled in a Georgetown court for custody of their five-year-old son, John, from the temple. So when John was born in 1972, the temple attorney signed an affidavit in which he stated that Jim Jones was John's father. Oh, God. Not Tim. Um, This document would later become the single most important document in Jonestown history. Um, Though Tim is listed on John's birth certificate, he essentially signed over his paternal rights and his son's life to the temple forever. So when Grace left the temple in 1976, she didn't take John with her, mostly because she believed Jim Jones when he said her life would be in danger if she left. So she also thought John's life would be in danger if she took him. But she immediately began to fight for custody, which she won. However, at that point, John was in Jonestown outside of their jurisdiction, outside of Georgetown um, jurisdiction. Uh, So there was nothing they could do. And John would never leave Jonestown. Wow. Yeah. In fear of being held in contempt of the orders to turn John over into custody, Jim Jones set up false sniper attacks against himself and began his first series of white night rehearsals called the six day siege. During that siege, Jones talked to the members about attacks from outsiders and had them surround the compound with guns and machetes. Jones's health started to decline in 1978. Oh, good riddance. Mm. He was informed he had a possible lung infection, to which he took a step further and announced to his followers he had lung cancer to garner sympathy and further support. During this time, he was abusing injectable Valium, quaaludes, stimulants, And barbiturates? Barbiturates. Sure. Yep. I don't do drugs. That's okay. Um, So Jones would continue to complain about a plethora of things like high blood pressure, strokes, temporary blindness, convulsions, 
swelling of his extremities, and weight loss of up to 30 pounds in the last few days of Jonestown. However, he was still noticeably overweight in his final days. Um, During meetings and public addresses, his speech was slurred. Words ran together or he tripped over them, and he'd often not even finish sentences, even with the words right in front of him. Hmm. Sound familiar? (laughs) Um, Anyway, so a stroke was definitely likely again. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. In November of 1978, U.S. Congressman Leo Ryan traveled to Guyana to inspect the People's Temple's activities and the compound. His visit was due to several reports that followers were being held against their will and some subjected to physical and psychological abuse, that if any were held against their will, it was simply peer pressure. Only Ryan and three others were initially accepted into Jonestown with the rest of this group allowed in after the sunset. That night, they attended a musical reception in the commune's main pavilion. Jones had ran rehearsals on how to convince Ryan and his group that everything was great and everyone was really happy, even though during his visit, Jones said he felt like a dying man and ranted about government conspiracies and his martyrdom. Two temple members, Vernon Gosney, and Monica Bagby made the first move to get out that night. In the pavilion, Gosney mistook journalist Don Harris for Ryan and passed him a note reading, quote, Dear Congressman, Vernon Gosney and Monica Bagby, please help us get out of Jonestown, end quote. A child nearby witnessed Gosney's act and verbally alerted other temple members like a little bitch. <laughs> I added that into the report. Whoa. Because we got another little bitch. Harris brought two notes, one of them, Gosney's, to Ryan and Congresswoman Jackie Spear. Yeah. Spear. 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 Yeah. According to Spear, in 2006, reading the notes caused her and Congressman to realize that something was very, very wrong. You think, lady? Yeah. (sighs) In the early morning of November 18th, 11 temple members sensed danger enough to walk out of Jonestown and all the way to the town of Matthews Ridge in the opposite direction from the Port Kaituma. Sure. Yeah. From the Port Kaituma airstrip. Those defectors included members of the family of Jonestown's head of security, Joe Wilson. When journalists and members of the concerned relatives arrived in Jonestown later that day, Marceline Jones gave them a tour of the settlement. That afternoon, the Parks and the Bogue families, Temple members, along with in-laws Christopher O'Neill and Harold Cordell, stepped forward and asked to be escorted out of Jonestown by the Ryan delegation. When Jones's adopted son Johnny attempted to talk Jerry Parks out of leaving, Parks told him, quote, no way, it's nothing but a communist prison camp, end quote. Jones gave the two families, along with Gosney and Bagby, permission to leave. When Don Harris handed Gosney's note to Jones during an interview in the pavilion, Jones stated that the defectors were lying and wanted to destroy Jonestown. Ryan stayed for only two days, and as Ryan tried to leave with several defectors in his truck headed to the airstrip, he was attacked but escaped unharmed. At the airstrip, he he wouldn't be as lucky. The first few seconds of the shooting were captured as an ENG video recording by NBC cameraman Bob Brown. Brown was killed along with Don Harris, Temple defector Patricia Parks, is he not now? And one other in the few minutes of the shooting, Ryan. Izzy, you're fired. Izzy, this is sad. This part's sad. (sighs) She doesn't like it. No. Ryan was killed after being shot more than 20 times. Jackie Spear was among the nine injured. After the shootings, the Cessnas... Cessnas. Yes. The Cessna's pilot, along with the pilot and co-pilot of the Twin Otter, fled in the Cessna to Georgetown. The damaged Twin Otter and the injured Ryan delegation members were left behind on the airstrip. Yeah. So um, before leaving Jonestown for the airstrip, Ryan had claimed that he would issue a report that would describe Jonestown in basically good terms. Ryan stated that none of the 60 relatives he had targeted for interviews wanted to leave. 
The 14 defectors const constituted a very small portion of Jonestown's residents that any sense of imprisonment the defectors had was likely because of peer pressure and a lack of physical transportation. So they didn't have anywhere to go. And right. They didn't have anything to drive them. And even if 200 of the 900 plus wanted to leave, quote, I'd still say you have a beautiful place here, end quote. <laughs> Despite this report, Joan said, quote, I have failed, end quote. It was reiterated that Ryan would be making a positive report, but Jones maintained that, quote, all is lost. After Ryan left Jonestown for Port Kaituma, Marceline Jones made a broadcast on the public address system stating that everything was all right and asking residents to return to their homes. During this time, AIDS prepared a large metal tub with grape flavor aid poisoned with Valium, chloral hydrate, Cyanide and Fenergan? Sure, yeah. Like I said, I don't do drugs. Yeah, I don't, I've never heard of it. I've literally never done drugs F in my life. Fenergan. <laughs> so, about 30 minutes after Marceline Jones's announcement, Jim Jones made his own, calling all members immediately to the pavilion. Oh. So there's a 45 minute cassette tape. Ew, oh, ew. Yeah, and it's known as the death tape. You can find this on YouTube. Um, I did not know this. Yeah. So it records part of the meeting Jones called inside the pavilion in the early morning of December 18th, 1978. When the assembly gathered, referring to the Ryan delegation's air travel back to Georgetown, Jones told the gathering, one of those people on the plane is going to shoot the pilot. I know that. I didn't plan it, but I know it's going to happen. They're going to shoot that pilot and down comes the plane into the jungle and we had better not have any of our children left when it's over because they'll parachute in here on us. Um, parroting Jones's prior statements that hostile forces would convert captured children to fascism, one temple member stated, quote, the ones that they take captured, they're going to just let them grow up and be dummies, end quote. On the tape, Jones urged Temple members to commit revolutionary suicide, mm -hmm. just as they'd rehearsed before. And according to Jonestown defectors, its theory was, quote, you can go down in history saying you chose your own way to go, and it is your commitment to refuse capitalism and in support of socialism, end quote. Once the shooters returned and declared the congressman dead, no dissent is heard on the tape. At this time, armed guards surrounded the pavilion. Even though Jones is praised on the tape, he expresses desire to speed up the process. According to escaped Temple member Odell Rhodes, the first to take the poison were Ruletta Paul and her one-year-old infant. A syringe without a needle fitted was used to squirt poison into the infant's mouth. Mm -hmm after which Paul squirted another syringe into her own mouth. Stanley Clayton, another survivor, also witnessed mothers with their babies first approach the tub containing the poison. Oh. Clayton said that Jones approached people to encourage them to drink the poison and that after adults saw the poison begin to take effect, quote, they showed a reluctance to die, end quote. Um, the poison caused death within five minutes for children less for babies, and on estimated 20 to 30 minutes for adults. Uh, after consuming the poison, according to Rhodes, people were then escorted away down a wooden walkway leading outside the pavilion. It is not clear if some initially thought the exercise was another white night rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Rhodes reported being in close contact with dying children. Um, in response to reactions of seeing the poison take effect on others, Jones counseled, Quote, die with a degree of dignity, lay down your life with dignity, don't lay down with tears and agony, end quote. He also said, quote, I tell you, I don't care how many screams you hear. I don't care how many anguished cries. Death is a million times preferable to 10 more days of this life. If you know what was ahead of you, if you knew what was ahead of you, you'd be glad to be stepping over tonight, end quote. What a prick. Mm-hmm. Rhodes described Rhodes' reminder he uh he? Uh, I don't know if Odell's a man or a woman. I don't know. Maybe they're non binary. Who yeah. knows? Um Odell was uh the escaped temple member, reminder. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Odell Rhodes described a scene of both hysteria and confusion as parents watched their children die from the po- from the poison. He, he also he he okay to so he there we go he boy he boy. <laughs> he also stated that most present quote quietly waited their turn to die, and that many of the assembled temple members quote walked around like they were in a trance end quote. This crowd was surrounded by armed guards offering members the basic dilemma of death by poison or death by a guard's hand. Cries and screams of children and adults were easily heard on the tape recording made. As more temple members died, eventually the guards themselves were called in to die by poison. Jones was found dead, lying next to his chair in the pavilion between two other bodies, his head cushioned by a pillow, his death was caused by a gunshot wound to his right temple that Guyanese chief medical examiner Leslie Mutu stated was consistent with being self-inflicted. The events at Jonestown constituted the great single loss of American civilian life in a deliberate act until the incidents of September 11th, 2001. Yeah, the greatest single loss. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did I say? Constituted the greatest single loss, yeah. Yeah. Jesus. So 912 of the 918 dead, including Jones himself, were collected by the United States military in Guyana, then transported by military cargo plane to Dover Air Base in Delaware, a location that had been used previously for mass processing of the dead from the Tenerife Airport disaster. Um, The last shipment of bodies arrived early on the morning of November 27th, 1978, The base's mortuary was tasked with fingerprinting, identifying, and processing the bodies. The base's resources were overwhelmed, and numerous individuals tasked with moving or identifying the bodies suffered symptoms of PTSD. In many cases, responsibility for cremation of the remains was distributed to Dover area funeral homes. In August 2014, the never-claimed cremated remains of nine people from Jonestown were found in a former funeral home in Dover, As of September 2014, four of their remains had been returned to next of kin, and the remaining five had not. Those five were publicly identified in the hope that family would claim their remains. So 918 people died that day. And we're not going to post this to social media, but if you are very morbid, you can Google pictures. There's tons of aerial shots of all of the bodies. Oh, yeah, I've seen them, yeah. Um, Ugh. There are pictures of inside the temple. There's pictures of the airstrip. And you can go on YouTube and type in Jonestown Death Tape 1978 and listen to those 44 minutes of Jones convincing his followers to kill themselves for him. A lot of people tried to escape and were just gunned down by the guards. I know. I'm so sad now. So, uh, I'm not going to lie. I copy and pasted a lot because this was a lot of information. Yeah, Most that's of fair. the information I got was from a, Brit- a Britannica.com article um, about the Jonestown massacre written by Allison Eldridge and then obviously our BFF Wikipedia. Um, I have seen a survivor of the Jonestown massacre on, I want to see like, a, I want to say like a psychic medium. <laughs> like show because she was trying to get in contact with her mother because th- this girl survived like her, they were at the airstrip her mom was handing her off to board the plane and was shot as she was like letting go of her oh my god so the daughter survived and the mom obviously did that cool that's yeah. such a great story you just told wasn't it wow wasn't awful at all no, that, I mean, that's our podcast is about happy, wonderful Quite things. Plus, can we talk about something wonderful? Now, can you tell me something wonderful? Something, I mean, it's not wonderful for you, but my wonderful is <laughs> I get a four-day weekend. Woo! That is wonderful. It is wonderful. I'm going to decorate the house for spoopy season. Yay, Halloween. Um, And then I'm just going to watch, like, a disgusting amount of TV. I have to watch Pen15. I have to watch... Travels with my father. I have to watch Away. I have to watch 
call the midwife. Great British Bake Off. I, I, that's on every Friday, so there's only on one episode. Oh, I didn't um, know this. I gotta watch a bunch of Housewives I'm backed up on. <laughs> I gotta watch Drag Race. I mean, there's just a disgusting amount of TV, as I as previously hey, stated. Hey, you've earned it. I have earned it. That is wonderful. You're very lucky. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. My wonderful might not sound wonderful at first, uh, but um, the week that we are recording this episode, uh, we lost Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh, yeah, that's definitely not a, uh, that's not a wonderful But one. hold on. Huh. I think there's just been a lot of negativity surrounding her death, which naturally, yeah, she's a huge loss. But I want to take an opportunity to say that my wonderful is her life. Okay. Her whole existence yeah. was pretty freaking wonderful. Yeah. And I know that there's a lot of drama going around with her yeah. passing, rightfully so, but I think we should Mitch take a McConnell moment. McConnell is a turd with skin stretched <laughs> over it. I just I I don't wanna I don't wanna think about that right now. I wanna think right. about I wanna honor her and I wanna celebrate her by saying she's my wonderful. Because she was so wonderful. RBG and uh, and Marty G. <laughs> oh, Marty Ginsburg. I ship. I ship so hard. They're together again. That's pretty wonderful. That is if you believe won- in that. That is pretty wonderful. If you believe that people are um, reunited with their loves, yeah. then, uh, then Marty and Kiki <laughs> are together again. Yeah. I mean, and you know, Ruth, if you're listening... We just want to say thank you. Thanks, Ruthie. As a young lady trying to maneuver this country. It ain't easy. Thank you for everything you did for us. We love you. Ruthie. And we celebrate you. Cheers. Oh, okay. There we go. We're drinking alcohol. So we're going to pick our topics really quick because I'm about to pee my pants. I'm going to do a little shuffle action. We're not going to pick Shuffly it out of a shuffle. Out of a jar today okay well it's a different thing every I'm time i'm a middle person all right i swear to god if this is aliens i'm gonna jump off i'm the gonna balcony. be so excited about this i'm gonna jump off the balcony we're only on the third floor so I, i'll maybe just break my ankle but all right go ahead what's your topic for next episode so i deaths oh Yay! Cool. <laughs> Oh, that's great. It comes Sorry. back oh. full circle. I, I heard that in my headphones. Sorry, people with headphones. I love how you're like, death, yay. Death, yay. <laughs> Celebrities dying, yay. Uh, shout out to that tour we went on like years Brian. ago. Brian. Uh, what was it called? It was, um, yes, Dearly Departed. Dearly Departed. It was, um, oh gosh. It was just about basically tragic Hollywood stories. It was so if you if you're if you live in LA or you're coming to visit LA, yes. this is not sponsored not by the way. All. We do not have sponsors but you yet. You can sponsor us. You can if you'd like, but this is just because we yes. enjoyed this tour so much. We did not expect this tour to be as baller as it was. Yes. Uh, but it was really, really cool. It was really fun. Um and Brian was a great tour. Brian guy. Donnelly. He knows his stuff. So Book yourself uh, once you can get on uh, vehicles with strangers again. Uh, book yourself a Dearly Departed tour. Make sure it's with Brian Donnelly and you will not be disappointed. I am adding him to my list of people to Brian uh, Donnelly. Oh my randomly God. randomly email. That episode would be three hours long. Do you remember how much that man rambles? I don't think people would care because once he opens his he mouth. He's gold. Everything he has to say is perfect. Yeah, we need to get Brian Donnelly. He can talk about his love for Stockard Channing. Yes. <gasps> yes. And his favorite celeb death. Maybe one that isn't covered on the tour. We yeah. all know what his favorite celeb death is, and that's um, Janis Joplin. Yeah. He was pretty into that one. Now, I'm telling you, we've been on this tour with this man twice. <laughs> um, different tours. Actually, the first tour he we went on was when we were like 21 we years old. We were 21 old. years old. It was my 21st birthday trip to LA before we even moved here. Yeah. Um, we took a star tour. <laughs> and As it, you do. Yeah. And it was celeb homes and like movie, like sets or scenes. Just like a studio and, uh, LA tour. Like- Brian was amazing he made driving around looking at the gates of celebrities somehow interesting he pointed out crazy 
crazy like celebrity mailboxes. Yes. And he was really, really into uh, license quiz, plates too. License plates and mailboxes. And he quizzed us on things we were passing and vanity I kept plates. winning. Oh yes, yeah, van- he, he was a I, I couldn't remember plates. what they're actually called, but vanity plates. Vanity plates, plates vanity yeah. Plates. Anyway, he's a really, really he's cool really, character. He's really, really great. Check him out. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, here we go. My topic for the next episode. I swear. Colts! Oh, again. There's That's plen- okay. Yeah, there's, there's plenty. plenty. There's plenty. I won't do join. Bloop. I won't do Jonestown. Don't do it. We already did that one. Oh, don't do it. Thanks for taking care of that one. <laughs> yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. So, it's Love Does and Colts is next time, and uh, hopefully we'll be uh, more literate. Um, anyway, so uh, you can find us on all the social medias at How Awful Podcast. Uh, you can email us at howawfulpodcast at gmail.com. You can go to howawfulpodcast.com and visit our website. That will also link you to our Patreon, um, where you can sign up, subscribe for a low, low monthly fee, um, different tiers for different peers. Um, yeah, and we haven't mentioned, but uh, the higher tier... Uh, which is a ten dollars per month mm-hmm. donors. Uh, the how awfulest. The how awful er. Awful er. Uh, we want to do something special. You know, once we get the ball rolling with all y'all, is uh, we want to do um, like a bonus episode that we'll do with a video. So mm-hmm. it'll be our faces telling you that uh, nobody asked for a story of your choice, and we figure we'll we'll join forces and we'll tell the story together. But whatever story you find interesting, uh, we will tell it in front of a camera. Correct. We are not in front of camera type of people, but nope. we think it might be fun. You can meet our assistant, Izzy. Yeah, she'll be there. All will be revealed. She'll be there. And the other guy, Moosh, will be there too. Yeah. Moosh the douche. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening, and uh, we'll see you next time. How awful. It's Izzy, really you're awful. Fired. Izzy, you haven't helped us at all. You're fired. As always, we've been B and Tanya Lee. Our logo was created by MJ Savard and our theme music courtesy of Nikki Lou.